Welcome to the Mean Lady Talking Podcast, the tough-talking, advice-giving show by the not-really-mean, mean lady, Susan J. Elliott. Everybody, this is Susan Elliott, host of Me Lady Talk and Podcast, and welcome to episode 67. Before we begin, I would like to thank everybody who participated in the July promotion. Those of you who have a book coming, I have just ordered a shipment of books, and I will find them and send them to you. I have a few wonderful people who said, please donate my book to a domestic violence victim shelter, and I will be doing that, and I will also match it. For those of you who are unaware, GPYB has a domestic violence victims program, and one of the things that we do is we send books to domestic violence shelters and organizations. And if you have an extra book around, It is fine for you to send a new or used book to your local domestic violence shelter or organization. And what I usually do is I give them a call. I ask them if it's okay. You can say the author's story is at the beginning of the book. The author is somebody who escaped domestic violence. She got out of the abusive marriage and she created the program that's been very successful for many years to help people get out of difficult, abusive relationships and how to work through the difficult breakup and to go on to be happy and healthy. So sometimes you have to tell the shelter or the organization why you're donating this book. And you can also tell them that GPYB has a matching book program and they could be expecting a book from us. I want to start thanking my meanies from the beginning Because as of this podcast, I'm releasing the podcast two days early to all my meanies. So what I've decided to do is to thank my meanies in alphabetical order, a few on every show. So if you're new, then I will add you to wherever I am in the alphabet at that time. I will slide you in, so have no fear. So tonight, I'm going to thank all of my A-meanies. We have Amanda. We have two Amy's. We have Amy M and Amy J. Thank you to the Amy's. We have Andrea. We have Angela. And we have Amory. Thank you, ladies, so very much. You are very special meanies, and I truly appreciate it. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I truly, truly appreciate your support. Thank you so much. And if you're out there and your name begins with an A and you become a meanie, I will slide you into whatever letter I'm on. So this is sort of like hurricanes. We're going to do it like that, except we're going to slide in new people. And I'm also going to be giving more bonuses in August. I have other things coming, and I'm also going to start at some point longevity bonuses for people who have been with the podcast and supporting the podcast a certain amount of time. Now, there's always this discussion in different podcast groups that I belong to about having a sponsor-based podcast or listener-based podcast. And different people have different reasons for doing things different ways. And I find it really annoying when I listen to a podcast and the first 15 minutes is all ads for their sponsors or they stop in the middle and they do 10 minutes worth of ads. And I just want to say that that will never happen on this podcast. Sponsors will never drive my content. I don't know how anybody could drive my content because I just sit here and blather most of the time. So I don't know. I can't control my content. I don't know how anybody else is going to. But having sponsors means that I could give my meanies more bonuses and I can also have some editing done. And if I could get some editing done, I could crank out more podcasts. And right now I have a list of Meanie requests for podcasts, and I'm getting to, and I'm looking them over, and I want to do a really good job because the meanie requests take priority, and I have the meanie requests, and I'm working on those podcasts, so have no fear. If I could get sponsors and more meanies, I could do more podcasts. Right now, I'm up to once a week, and as I've said on other podcasts, my original goal was to do two podcast a week. And I would really love to do that, especially when I have some special ones in the works, which is the Jody Arias and the Chris Watts. But 
I need more supporters to get sponsors because I need to let sponsors know that my listeners are really engaged. And I have a lot of listeners. I have hundreds of listeners for each podcast, but I don't have hundreds of supporters. So it doesn't show that my listeners are really engaged in the podcast. So I would need to show that to a sponsor. So if you're out there and you're listening to the podcast, you really love the podcast, please consider supporting it. But as I said, I can't support it on my own and there are expenses that come up. The last podcast, the editing was over 12 hours because I'm getting used to the new microphone and the new interface and there were different things that went on and I didn't understand it because I have different issues with the new microphone than with the old microphone. And I've never really worked with an interface before. So there are different things that went on that I didn't really understand. I had to look them up. I had to watch videos. I had to do a whole bunch of things. And then I became very exasperated. And I would like to be able to enlist the aid of an editor when things like that happen. I didn't enlist an editor because I really didn't have the money to do so after getting the new microphone and the interface. So I would really prefer to keep the podcast listeners supported. And I would like to thank everybody who is supporting the podcast. I think that it's really special. It shows me that you work the GPYB program because the GPYB program is about giving back. And I do several articles every year about giving back and about showing gratitude and things like that. And it's not just about giving back to GPYB, of course. It's about giving back. And I have articles that I run every New Year's about giving to the world community and waiting you're making resolutions. You should think about charities and things like that. And people have struggled with being overly generous. I always tell them, if you feel generous, you want to think, oh, I'm a good person. I do things with people. Go work at an animal shelter. Go work at a domestic violence shelter. Give those people your money. Do that. Don't give some broken down boyfriend or girlfriend your money. So GPYB is very big on giving back to the world community and giving back. And I think that those meanies who support the podcast are giving back to the program. And I truly, truly appreciate it. So the less time I spend on editing, the better you're going to get a, the same product. You're going to get a 45 minute podcast. Only it's not going to take me 12 hours. And I can use that 12 hours to do other things for GPYB and an editor's results will probably be better than mine. Cause I'm a really bad editor. I really don't understand audio and all the things that go into it. And I'm learning, but the learning curve is very, very steep. And there's a lot of numbers involved and I just don't understand it. Minus what, DB? What? What are we talking about here? So I told you guys, like, I am a math moron and I just, and I, yeah, I know that's a negative affirmation, but it's true. I am a math moron and I'm never going to be anything else. And I've never used algebra in my whole adult life. So please leave me alone. Right? Four to half of the podcast, the better off we'll all be. And I know that you can sometimes hear the clunky editing and I apologize, but I listened to a few of the early ones the other day and I'm getting better but I'm still a one-man band and it's still very foreign to me. So anyway, I want to talk about a couple of things before I get into this letter that I'm about to answer. One of them is the Jody Arias stuff. Her appeal is up next. So I really am going to jump on this. I have been looking at it. And even if you're not interested in the true crime stuff, the Jody Arias stuff is really about a relationship. It's about a relationship that went really wrong. And it's about two people who had this really dysfunctional relationship. It's about no contact. It's about personality disorders. It's about male stalking victims not being taken seriously. It's about the way Travis Alexander was raised, how he grew up, how he really didn't know how to express fear. He had a really dysfunctional childhood. And I'm going to talk about all this, even though I'm going to talk about the appeal. And the reason I'm talking about the appeal is because when the appeal came out last summer, a lot of people were saying things about it. And the misinformation was just incredible. People were talking, oh, I bet Jody wrote this. I'm sure Jody didn't write any of that. I mean, I wrote a criminal appeal and my... My client did not write any of that. There was just a lot of misinformation about what people were saying. Why didn't they talk about this? Why didn't they talk about that? Things that were never brought up at trial. You can't do that in appeal. So anyway, the reason that I decided to do the podcast on the on the appeal is because there was just so much misinformation. I'm not going to release it on a regular podcast. I'm going to release it in between. And it's going to be more than one episode because the 
the appeal is just very large and I'm working on it and I don't normally script my podcast and I don't even outline them. But the Jody area stuff I'm outlining because there's so much stuff to talk about. But I urge you, even if you're not interested in the true crime stuff, listen to the Jody Arias podcast because I am going to talk a lot about relationship stuff, a lot about personality disorders, a lot about a lot of things. And people that don't know the story can learn the story because the trial just went on for months and a lot of people didn't watch it. I've watched it a few times and I know that parts of it were very slow. Her attorney talked very slow. He mispronounced words, drove me completely nuts. The one that drove me the craziest was hyperbole. He kept pronouncing it hyperbole. I I just wanted to like drive nails into my head every time he said it. But I truly invite people who are not interested in the true crime stuff to tune into that because I think there's a lot of good stuff on relationship, personality disorders, growing up in a dysfunctional substance abuse home and domestic violence. The other one is Chris Watts. Now, I did my podcast on the Watts family murders because there was also so much misinformation about narcissism and it was making me nuts. There was also a lot of misinformation about lupus and I have lupus and there was a lot of victim blaming with Shanann Watts and it drove me crazy. So I did my podcast series on the Watts family murders for those reasons to clear up a lot of misinformation about how personality disorders are to discuss is he or is he not a narcissist? Is he a psychopath? Is he a sociopath? Blah, blah, blah. If you haven't heard the Watts Family Murder Podcast, I'll put links to it in the show notes. And all that came out before his confession. And so I did tell people I was going to do a podcast on Nicole Kassinger, his mistress. And I'm going to do that. And I've actually did one. But it was so snarky that it wasn't giving information about narcissism and infidelity and things like that. It was just really a lot of snark. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to rub her into the ground, even though I personally want to rub her into the ground. I don't want to rub her into the ground on the podcast. I want it to be more than just me screaming about her because that's what's going on on YouTube. And I just don't think that I want to jump into that fray. So I did my podcast before his confession. I was going to update it. And now his confession came out in February. And people have asked me ever since, where is your update? He confessed in February. And what's happened is that there's been almost a cottage industry for the Watts family murders. And all these people on YouTube, suddenly they're all talking about it. And they're manufacturing all kinds of things to talk about. Because there's not really a lot of things to talk about at this point, except the HLN special, which really wasn't a lot of new information. It was just a lot of new pictures and things like that. And one of the things that happened was there was this guy, the armchair detective, and before Chris Watts confessed, the armchair detective, and I think that I've mentioned this on another podcast, he said he put out a video called What the Shadows Knew. And in that, he contended that the girls were getting in the truck. And people were saying, oh my God, that's terrible. Chris Watts is a monster, but he's not that much of a monster. Like he didn't drive those girls out alive and then kill them at the site. You know, what did he do? Dump them into the barrels alive? You know, that's all that people could think about. And the armchair detective said, no, I see the kids. So Chris confessed, and it turns out those were the kids. So I don't want to say that he had his 15 minutes of fame, but you know, he had his 15 minutes of fame. And then he continued, like he continued on. He's now saying that he can see that there was another adult in the video. And people are saying, you know what? You were right the first time, but there is another adult. And if there was another adult, why didn't you mention it the first time? Like, why didn't you mention it, you know, what the shadow saw? And he was saying, yeah, well, you people didn't believe me the first time. And I was right. So I'm right again. And this whole controversy about Nicole Kessinger was involved. She wasn't involved. I don't think she was involved. Anyway, there's an attorney in Colorado, which is where these murders took place, and his name is Scott Reich, and he gives a very smart, sane, measured videos, and he's very good, and I really like him, and he normally doesn't jump into all this craziness that goes on, but he did take on the, what he's calling the accomplice theory, and he's very credible, he's very capable, he's very smart, and he's the Bunk the accomplice theory, as he's calling it. But there are all these other wackos that have sprung up on YouTube, and they're just screaming about all these things. Chris Watts has his girlfriend named Anna. People are talking about her, and then there's all these people that are still victim-blaming. And Cindy Watts 
read a letter that Chris Watts wrote, and it was on the HLN special, and people didn't know why she went on it and made her look bad. And of course, Chris looks bad. It was like he's a martyr, right? He's a psycho. But there's people who are supporting him, and I don't even know how you could support this man. I really don't know how, but there are people, and they're saying Shanann was a harpy, like that makes any difference. You know, if a woman's a harpy, she shouldn't be martyred. But there's this little cottage industry that has sprung up, and all these people that are screeching and yelling and calling each other names, and, and going back and forth, and doing all kinds of things. And the only thing that they have going for them is they have an opinion about Chris Watts. Other than Scott Reich who, like I said, is an attorney in Colorado. Where these murders happen, he's a very learned man. He's very measured. I really like him. I like his style. I like his information. And I believe him. But other than that, there's not a lot of people that have anything to give. They don't have credentials in any field whatsoever. They're just a bunch of wackos using the Chris Watts thing to get views. And I didn't want to jump into that fray. So all this is to say that I've held off on these podcasts and people keep emailing me and asking me where they are because I didn't want to jump into wacko land. It just seems like all these people are crazy and I just wanted to wait for the dust to settle and for it to die down, but it seems like it's not. So, okay, I'm going to do the podcast because it doesn't seem like any of these people are going anywhere. So, and they're just manufacturing this stuff, and I don't want to jump into the fray. I don't want to be part of that package, but I don't know whatever the hell's going on there, so I've held back, but I'm going to publish it, okay? So I will publish it. So I'm going to crank out the Jedi Arias. I'm going to crank out the Chris Watts. I'm not going to put them on regular podcast days, and I'm going to talk about personality disorders on the Chris Watts thing. I'm going to talk about victim blame, and I'm going to talk about other things, so... And, and I'm also going to talk about if your wife is cranky, that doesn't mean you get to kill her. So anyway, I had this letter from the Wayback Machine and I came across it the other day and I was like, I have to read this on the podcast. And I'm not even sure when I got this letter. It was just printed out in a pile of papers and I couldn't figure out when I got it. I went back through. I was looking for it. I couldn't figure it out. Anyway, here we go. Hi, Susan. I am a woman who recently purchased your book after breaking up with my partner of 11 years. Just over two months ago, we spent six years living together. Then I cheated on him, left him for the man I cheated with him on, only to come crawling back a few months later. I realized that I had been an immature fool who just let lust carry her away. <laughs> Speaking of Chris Watts, lust carrying you away, that's exactly what happened to him. The other thing, and I hate to go jump back to the Chris Watts thing for a moment, but the other thing that's come out is people are saying that Chris is autistic. It, it has nothing to do with why he murdered everybody, but it has to do with why he seems so lack of empathy when he was given the confession in February, even though he was saying that every night he talks to his kids, so sorry, and blah, blah, blah. There is this contingency that is saying that people who have autism are easily manipulated, and he might have been manipulated by... Nicole Kessinger, and they're also so aimed to please. And they you can actually see that in the confession before he went to prison, the first confession, because Tammy was saying, did Shanann do something to the kids? And then he was like, yes, yeah, yeah, Shanann was killing the kids and then I killed her. So you could see that he was kind of going for that approval. But that works on people that are not autistic. You know, they're just trying to get some inroad into the confession. So... I'm not feeling that I'm buying that whole thing because now there's people that are picking that up who support him and who are picking that up saying, oh, well, it must have been Nicole Kessinger. She must have manipulated him. She must have, you know, he must have killed everybody to get her approval, blah, blah, blah. He still killed him and autism doesn't have anything to do with it. Okay, I'm going to look into that more and I'm going to talk about that more in the podcast, but I just want to throw that out. That's some food for thought. Another reason why you might want to tune into the to the podcast so anyway let's go back to this looney tune anyway i broke up with him he moved back home uh back home where's back home um to his wife to his mother where's back home he moved back home when we attempted long distance oh back home must be where he came from he, they must have met someplace where he wasn't from we attempted long distance basically we saw each other several times a year sent each other romantic cards called daily sent flowers but ultimately fooled around and disrespected the relationship if we knew the other one wouldn't find out. <laughs> well, it seems like they're both cheaters. This is fabulous. See why I want to read this on the podcast? This is crazy. Maybe it was guilt, but throughout the last four years, we couldn't cut each other off. No, this isn't guilt. This is called relationship addiction. 
I hate to jump into this letter here, but this is called relationship addiction. It's called love addiction. It's called not being able to let a chaotic relationship go because it keeps you from looking inward. Okay, so it's not guilt. Let's like put that one to the side. Really, I moved to where he lives to be with him. We had a blissful three months and he proposed. <laughs> so great. Three blissful months after four crazy years where they couldn't let each other go and, and a number of other years where they're playing each other for fools. And But after three blissful months, he proposes. Fabulous. I then found out, oh, here's a surprise, that he simultaneously was dating some other girl. No kidding. <laughs> Gee, didn't see that coming. It was beyond devastating. Why? Like, why would that be devastating? It sounds like the two of them did nothing but cheat on each other. My ego was crushed. How was your ego crushed? I'm lonely and I realized that I left my entire life behind only to fall on my face. She didn't see that coming. We instituted no contact and I'm working through the book and the program, but I have not fully accepted that it's over. In fact, I believe that if I do the work in the book and wait and see, then there is a chance that we can make amends if he too has done the work to get over a breakup. I don't understand where this is going. Hang on. I have to check this, this letter out a, a second time. I recently purchased the book. Okay, so she just recently, oh, she broke up with him two months ago and just recently purchased the book. So here we are two months on and she's got this whole thing figured out. Okay, great. So she's putting the cart before the horse with, I believe that if I do the work and wait and see, then there's a chance we can make amends. Ah, you, this is crazy. I'm not sure where this is going. He has reached out to me many times around wanting to meet up and also to let me know how much he misses me. It's been two months. I follow the book and I ignore him because I do firmly realize that we both need to heal. But so she's deciding what they both need to do. And he's deciding that all he wants to do is hurt her and continue the game. All he wants to do is see her, talk to her and continue the game. Seeing him would only hurt me and the grief needs to go away before any contact can be made. So I do the work. I sit on my hands and I try to keep busy with my own life. Life. I have removed him from my social media altogether, but we live only five blocks apart. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this ought to work. I avoid him at all costs. I realize that my only reason for contacting him would be so that he wouldn't be able to move on. And that isn't love. No, really? Are you kidding me? That's not love? Can you please give me some reflection on my thought process? I don't mean to be laughing at her, but that's a weird way to frame. Tell me what I'm thinking. When is it okay to speak to him? It's like, are you kidding me? Like, are you reading the books? Read it again, because I think you missed the point. It is my hope of reuniting with him after the work has been done. Yeah, well, your hope is just, like George Costanza said, the only hope is no hope. Get rid of the hope. <laughs> Jesus. Do you think that there is any chance of reuniting with him after? No. Read the book, then read it again, because I don't think you're getting it. The post about being a bad guy really struck a chord with me. Oh, I have a post that's called When You Are the Banana Head, and if I can find it, I'll put it in the show notes. The show notes are getting very long. I struggle to believe that the negative things that I wrote about him were writing in my relationship inventory. You're writing a relationship inventory? What? Like, he's still trying to contact you. It's only been two months, and now she's writing a relationship inventory story are we jumping over a whole bunch of stuff here i think so i think so i put something in on the getting breakup.com website in the resources there is a a button that's called how to use the books in the workbook to do the work and to work the program and it has in there checklists to see if you're ready for the relationship inventory she is not ready for the relationship inventory i don't care i don't have to even go through that checklist i know she's not because this whole letter is just foolish so i do feel that if i do my work i can make things better this is completely crazy what do you think i think uh let's see what do i think everybody out there in podcast meanie land tell me what i think what do you think think this is going to work out think they're going to have a great reunion think that we're all going to go to the land of oz and hold hands and sing kubaya i think not everybody call in and tell me what you think i want to hear it what do you think i think Let's take a quiz. Let's stop the podcast right here and take a quiz. What do I think? Huh. Jesus. Okay. Do you think that I can make things better? 
Oh, my goodness. Okay. I have some clients who are trying to do this. Now, sometimes I let clients keep going with foolish notions because I know that if I try to stop them, they're just going to see me as being a big mean lady and they're going to be like going off in a huff and having a tantrum and going to see their future boyfriend, girlfriend anyway, because this whole in-between stuff, this is all just foolishness. Anyway, I sometimes say nothing when my clients are doing crazy things because I just know, like, they're not going to listen to me right now. So if you're one of my clients, you're doing crazy things, it doesn't mean that I'm a-okaying it. It means that I'm going, mm, let me get some popcorn and sit on the sidelines wait for this shit to blow up. Okay, so, and then I'll pick up the pieces. <laughs> okay, it, I, you know, I... I think that when you're doing this work, getting past your breakup while hoping for a reconciliation is self-defeating. And I'm sure that people know that I think this because you're not going to be truly committed to one and you're not going to be committed to the other. And it's showing this like she's in such a rush. She's rushing through the program. She doesn't really believe the stuff she's writing in the relationship inventory. She's not doing it correctly from jump. So it's not going to work. It's just not going to work. You have to accept that the relationship that you had is over. It's over. I say this in the book. Even if you hope to reconcile, you have to grieve the relationship that you had because it didn't work. And this one is dysfunctional and they're both cheating on each other. It is very rare, especially in cases where there's been infidelity on both sides that a reconciliation is going to work out. People aren't going to trust each other. People who get back together continue to play stupid games with each other. They don't trust each other. It's what they do. It's what they know how to do. And I don't know how you can get healthy and go back to a person that you had such a sick relationship with because there was a certain dynamic in a sick relationship. And even if he gets well, and there's absolutely zero, zero, zero evidence that he's doing anything besides calling her like a crazy person. And she's like two months into getting well, and she's not really getting well because she's so focused on him. Two people have a certain dynamic. Dynamic doesn't work when people both get well. And I've seen this in couples counseling. When couples come to me with really serious issues, a lot of times they work hard in individual therapy and couples therapy, but it doesn't work out because they're not the same people when they do their work. And sometimes one person really works hard. The other person kind of takes it slow, kind of mediocre, kind of blah, blah, blah. You know, not everybody gets well at the same time. Not everybody has the same ability to get well. And not everybody has the same ability to get well on the same time frame that their partner does. And I've seen this. In couples counseling, where people have really serious problems, it's very clients to not only work through the wreckage of the past, but to do it in such a way that you're still attracted to each other when the whole thing is behind you and you're both working on being a healthy person. We don't know that he's working on anything, but suppose he is. Okay, let's for argument's sake say that. Suppose he's out somewhere doing the work. Let's go. Let's all go to fantasy land. We're all together in the land of Oz. Let's hold hands, sing Kumbaya. And yes, we're all getting back together. We're all getting back together. And what you're going to do is you're going to have the same dynamic. It will be very rare for them not to. And if they both done work and they both worked on themselves, chances are that they're not going to have the same attraction because the attraction was based on a lot of dysfunctional bullshit. That's what it was based on. And it was based on all these frigging games that they played with each other. They sleep with other people. They come back. They play all these games. And it's sick and it's crazy. It's chaotic. And two healed people are going to get together and go, hey, you're not the same person. No, it's not going to happen. And I tell people this. If you're getting well and your ex is out there, they could be doing work. They could be working on themselves, but you have no clue that they're doing any of the work that's going to result in the two of you still being good for each other. Or you each are going to wonder if the other is still going to be deceitful. I mean, what is the person working on? When I talk about these things and getting back out there, and she wrote me this letter before getting back out there was published, 
But in getting back out there, there's something called the you me list where you put down, this is what I want in me and this is what I want in you and this is what I've done in previous relationships that I can't do anymore. And this is what I don't want to do in future relationships. And this is what I put up with and this is what I don't want to. And you're on your side of the list. And this is what I put up with the previous relationships and I don't want to do it and blah, blah, blah. And this is what I have to have and this is what I don't have to have. And she should have, I want to be faithful in future relationships and I want somebody who's going to be faithful. And I don't know how you get there from here. But this is why I keep telling people that getting back out there is not a dating book. It's a book that you should have right after you break up because you have to look at those things. You have to look at the you, me list. You have to look at things you've done in previous relationships that you don't want to do again. Get getting back out there as soon as you get getting past your breakup and go to the workbook and look at the things that I have in the workbook about how to use the two books together. And if you've done things in relationships that are not cool and you don't want to do it again, do the you, me list and put this stuff on there. She doesn't know if he's doing any work to make himself not be deceitful, not to be unfaithful, and he has no clue what she's doing because they're not talking to each other and they shouldn't be talking. This is all pie in the sky. Pie in the sky for somebody who's two months into recovery and, and is trying to do relationship inventory when she's not even focused on what the hell it is she's doing. So I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know how you're going to be a half a healthy whole person if you're not completely focused on yourself when you're doing the work. You have to be focused on yourself, not what your ex is doing or not doing, and not, gee, maybe if they do X, Y, and Z, we'll get together and everything will be hunky freaking dory because it won't be. You don't go in to change yourself with hopes of reconciliation. I'm going to change myself into the person that my ex wants me to be, and everything's going to be hunky-dory, and we're all going to go to the land of Oz, and we're all going to hold hands and sing Kumbaya. No, we're not. If there were to be a reconciliation down the road, and that would be one big if, and you're both a happy and healthy person, oh my goodness, that's a long way off, and it would be a miracle. And then a miracle happened in the land of Oz. It's like we're just going to go back to the pattern. I cheated, he cheated, we all cheated. Infidelity is not about love. It's about insecurity. It's about jealousy. It's about trying to be the primary person in somebody else's in a relationship where someone has other urges for other people. Fidelity is not just about resisting urges. It's about many other things. But it's almost impossible for two people who have the history together, who have both done it at the same time to come back and have the same level of honesty and the same commitment to never do it again. I mean, we're talking about pie in the freaking sky. All relationships, all romantic relationships must have trust and trust is a very fragile thing. And it's very difficult to rebuild even when only one person has cheated. It's almost impossible to do it when Two people have cheated. We're talking long term, it would be a long shot. She needs to look at why she cheated and worry only about that. What was she looking for? Why did it continue? Why did she move to be with somebody who wasn't right? And then they have this crazy game going on and she pushes for an engagement and he proposes and he still has someone else on the side. What the hell is that? That is all crazy. That is all bullshit games. And if somebody is seeing someone else while trying to build up to a marriage proposal, the whole thing is doomed. It's just completely doomed. All her letter is saying is we can't quit each other. And that's not a sign of love. That's a sign of obsession. It's a sign of Love addiction, it's a sign of relationship addiction, it's a sign of being addicted to this one person. Because if you're a healthy person, the minute unloving stuff comes along and infidelity is the most unloving thing you can do, you know, it's just not going to work. There's so many things wrong in this relationship and yet they're still trying to figure it out with these nutty games. It's been a game. It's been an unhealthy and ruthless game and it's a stupid relationship. It's a stupid relationship that is based on addiction. It's not based on love or anything else. And success in future relationship depends on becoming a healthy person. And you cannot get better and then magically restore and repair what was broken by infidelity on both sides because both people have to change. And then each of them has to go through the process of change where you go through a program where you change, you cannot be the same person you were when you were in that relationship. And if it didn't work out then, 
people change in different ways. Even if they both worked a program, worked it as hard as they could. I've just seen this. Again, it's like I have 25 years experience of working with people. And I have seen this with one person being my client and with a couple being my client. And many times when they've had serious issues and both people work as hard as they can, they come out on the other side and they just don't care about each other. They're not each other's 3 a.m. person because when they're in these sick and chaotic relationships, they're not worried about 3 a.m. person. They're worried about these stupid games. And who you want your 3 a.m. person to be after you do the Getting Past Your Breakup program is going to be very different than when you started. You know, one person says, I'm going to be doing stuff over here. And the other person says, I'm going to be doing stuff over here. You know, we're all going to therapy. We're all going to Oz. We're all singing Kumbaya. And everything's going to be hunky-dory. And nothing's going to be hunky-dory. It's just pie in the freaking sky. You don't know that you two are going to change in a way that's going to be compatible with each other. You can fool yourself into thinking that that's what's going to happen, but chances are it's not going to be. If a relationship is based on dysfunction, being functional will render it, will render the two of them incompatible. If a person truly recovers, they have no time for games and manipulation. And that's exactly what went on in this relationship. And if both people recover, they're not going to accept another person being on the perimeter of the relationship having a side chick or a side dude, it's not going to work because if you're a healthy person, you don't have a side anything except a side of potatoes when you go out to dinner. But when you get healthy, you have new goals, you have new boundaries, you don't settle for garbage behavior. And a lot of things that she described in this relationship, a healthy person would say once and I'm out of here. But they've each done it to each other multiple times. There's so much pain, there's so many scars, there's so much heartache. And when you get healthy and you don't accept garbage behavior, that's inherent in dysfunctional people. It doesn't mean if you get to the point where you're functional, you're going to see the other person as being someone who tried to get you to accept garbage. I instruct against reconciliation when there has been a history like this. Because even if you change separate and apart from each other, it doesn't mean it's going to work again, no matter what you do. And you cannot work the GPYB program with thoughts of reconciliation and that's the end goal because it's not going to work. You cannot have one eye on reconciliation and one eye on doing the program. You're splitting yourself in two and it's not going to work. GPYB must have your full attention. And if you're thinking about reconciliation, if you're thinking about, well, if I change this, if I change that, if he changes this, if he changes that, it's not going to work. You should work on whatever drove you to cheat on this guy and figure it out because you don't want that in your next relationship. Do the you, me list, do the standards and compatibility list and decide that you don't want this behavior from you. I don't think you should contact him again because he might still be seeing somebody, says he misses her, and the game is on again. And if they get in contact with each other, the game is going to be on. And the only way to win is not to play the game. And it doesn't sound like she's strong enough to not play the game. I think that if you're in a situation like this, you have to put all your thoughts of reconciliation on hold and get yourself well. The work is for you and only you, and that is a full-time job. When you work all through the GPYB program, you get your feet under you and you make decisions about what it is you need and what is best for you from here on in. Maybe they would have completely different agendas, different goals, but you have to go to therapy. You have to do the work in the workbook. You have to do the work in the books. And I think you have to go to other programs. I think that these two need Sexaholics Anonymous, SLAA. I believe they both need SLAA. And they shouldn't be twiddling their thumbs and waiting for the other person to get well because they're a mess. Doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that is going to get you nowhere. You have to go to therapy, go to 12-step meetings, SLLA, read this book, read that book. And you both really need hardcore recovery. And going two months into this and doing the relationship inventory, that is not hardcore recovery. And I don't know what the hell he needs. I don't think he knows what the hell he needs. It's absolutely ridiculous. They were together 11 years. They lived for six of those. They played footsie for four of those. It's a long time. They were doing damage and hurtful things to each other along the way. And it would take a long time to recover. 
Now, one of the podcasts that I'm going to do, one of the meetings requested talking about that is talking about the timeline. And I'm actually going to do a podcast on that, a part of a podcast on that. Because when you've been together a long time and you've been with somebody since you were young, and that happened to me in my first marriage, we were together as teenagers. And then he took off. He went away. I went into a really abusive relationship. I came out with PTSD. And I really didn't want a boyfriend. And then I kept pushing him away and pushing him away. And he was stalking me. And now I could see that he was stalking me. A lot of dysfunctional craziness went on. He wanted the girl that I was before he went away, the girl I was in high school, the girl that used to go swimming with him on Saturdays and listen to music and all this other stuff. But when I was in that relationship between being with him, I had PTSD. I was completely crazy. I wanted to be left alone and he wouldn't leave me alone. Then after we got married, he held all that against me. All the things I said and did in that time when he was chasing me and chasing me. This is what young people do. They damage each other and they damage each other in ways that they don't understand and they don't understand what the adult consequences are going to be. So the best thing to do is to put a period and end it. If it's dead, bury it and don't worry about reconciliation. When you're very young, when you get together and over the years, you play a lot of games, a lot of young, foolish games. And I know because I've been there and I've done that. And when I got married to my first husband, I had no idea he was going to hold all that stuff against me. And when I decided to be in a relationship with him, really be in a relationship with him, I was going to dedicate my entire being to that relationship. And what he was going to do was punish me for what I had done in the time when I was pushing him away. And I had no idea about this, no idea at all. Uh, You know, I kept trying to make it up to him without thinking, wait a minute, why am I being punished for this? This is crazy. And I had to get into therapy and I had to throw my entire being into being in therapy and being healthy and being told that this is crazy. And there is no way of knowing that the patterns that were in the past will not be the future patterns. Just because you've grown and matured doesn't mean that they're going to be able to put it back together. It probably doesn't mean that at all. It means it's just going to be that you're going to have to learn and grow from your mistakes. And if you're going to have a healthy relationship, it's probably not going to be with each other. You need to let it be okay to just let it go. If this other person doesn't want to let it go, what was a very, very sick relationship, you have to not worry about what he wants. Don't talk to him. Don't get into any relationships. But part of getting healthy is recognizing, my God, this was a sick and twisted relationship and I need to let it go. I need to move on. And maybe sometime in the future, if their paths cross and reconciliation takes place, magic happens. But right now, the goal is to end it, period. It's dead, bury it. That relationship is dead and it should be. Do the program for you and only you. Go to therapy, go to 12-step meetings, keep doing the program. Do the you, me list. Do the standards of compatibility list. Figure out who your 3 a.m. person is without thinking about him. Now, it doesn't sound like she's sincerely doing the relationship inventory. She's doing it with reservation. She's doing it with reconciliation in mind. She's not doing it honestly. You need to do the relationship inventory honestly. Go to how to do the program with the books and the workbook, and there is a checklist in there as to when you're ready for the relationship inventory. She says, I struggled to believe the negative things I wrote about him when writing my relationship inventory. And then she says, if I feel if I do my work, I can make it better. That's called ambivalence. And if she continues to be ambivalent, she's not going to do the relationship inventory the way it's supposed to be done. She's going to continue to fool herself. She's going to say she's making this up. She's going to say it's my fault. She's saying I shouldn't have fooled around. Even though he's got someone on the side, he's proposing marriage. Even though there's no indication that he's doing any kind of work of anything. You cannot take the idea of reconciliation with your ex. You have to go with the idea that the relationship is dead. It needs to remain dead. You're never getting back together. You need to build your life and move on. That's the way you have to do it. If for some reason a miracle happens... And the relationship happens again in the future. It's not going to happen right now. That old relationship is never going to happen. It needs to be grieved and you need to move on. Okay, guys, I hope that somebody learned something from this podcast. And if you're not a meanie, please go to meanladytalking.com and sign up. And if you are a meanie, I thank you so much. And please enjoy this podcast two days early. 
and I'll talk to you guys in Meanie Land. And if you have questions, comments, send your cards and letters to Mean Lady Talking at MeanLadyTalks.com and Meanies Get Priorities. And I'll be doing a few more shows in the future. Have no fear. Talk to you guys later. Take care, everybody. Hey, be careful out there. Take care, all. Bye-bye.